Welcome to the Humans Under Grace Bible Study Podcast. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned line-on-line, precept-on-precept study of God's Word to search out those deeper truths and gain a greater understanding of the Bible. We would love for you to join us today as we dig in and learn what it is God would truly have us to know from His letter that He wrote to us. All right, God bless you and welcome into this episode of the Humans Under Grace Bible Study. I'm going to be getting right back into Genesis, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. And whenever we left off in our last study, we see that God had changed Abram's name to Abraham, meaning the, the father of many nations, and blessed Ishmael that he would have 12 sons, and that'd be 12 kings. And then also, we can trace that through Isaac, and see that Isaac, through Jacob, also had 12 sons, or grandsons, that would become patriarchs of the kingdom of Israel as well. So we'll pick it up in chapter 18, verse 1. We'll ask for that clarity and understanding from our Father in Jesus' name. And verse 1 reads, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he's a, he's a shepherd, you know, he's, it's, it's hot, it's afternoon time, and he's just kind of taking him a break in the shade. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran out to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, three in biblical numerics means divine perfection. You know, you have the divine perfection of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these, this three is going to be pretty symbolic in this chapter. Verse 3, and said, My Lord, if now I found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under a tree. Now, this washing their feet, you see back then they didn't have shoes or, or cars. They walked around in sandals, and so their feet got dirty. So this was a way of, you know, kind of tending to guests. You allowed them to wash their feet off, get all the... the the crud off of them from this world, and get cleaned up. Verse 5, And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort you your hearts, and comfort ye your hearts, after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant, and they said, So do, and thou hast said. So do as thou hast said. So now we see that this is God and two angels, as we're going to eventually see. And what are they doing here? They're eating men's food. He's fixing to make them uh, some bread and some meat and some milk, and they're going to eat it. Now, you know, many people wonder, well, what's it like? You know, how? what are the different bodies and everything? Well, we see right here in this somewhat of transfigured body, a, a body that we can see them in, in this dimension, they're able to eat this same substance that we eat. Also, the manna that fell from heaven is called angel's food in the Psalms. And so we see that the bodies aren't that different. I mean, they're, a spiritual body is perfect. It don't get old or wither or, or, or corrode or anything like that. It don't get sick, whereas these flesh bodies do. But at the same time, we look the, identical, the exact same as we did in a spiritual body, minus any age or, or withering. Verse 6. And Abraham hasted into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man, and he said, and he hasted to dress it. So he's, he's trying to hurry up. You know, he don't want to hold him up too long. But he's also getting the good of what he has. He's not just grabbing any old calf out there. He got a good, a good one. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they, verse 9, and they, did, and they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee the time of life. Now that, what that means is basically fertility. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which she was by, where she was behind him. 
Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Basically, it means she was she couldn't bear children anymore. She she was past that stage in life and was no longer fertile. Verse twelve. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. Now that's important. Within herself, saying, "After I am waxed old, shall I pleasure? Shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also." So am I really, I'm, I'm this old, am I really fixing to have a kid? And, you know, it was, I'm sure there was a lot of joy in this. But then, you know, at the same time, the flesh kind of kicked in and was kind of, man, you know, I'm, I'm 90 years old. And the Lord said, said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Now see, in verse 12, Sarah laughed within herself. That proves right there God is the cardio-knower. He knows our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you got to, you, you take prayer out of school and you can't pray here and you can't pray there. Sarah thought this within herself and God heard it. That's all you got to do. You, you, you can sit there and pray wherever you're at and nobody will ever know you're praying, but you're steadily talking to the Father. Verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Meaning at, at, when, it's, when it's time, she'll be fertile again. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So basically saying, you know, that was, how did he, how did he know? And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abram went with them to bring them on the way. So he was kind of walking them out. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abram the thing which I do? Now he's looking toward Sodom, and you've got to remember here, Lot is in Sodom. And Abram just got him back not long ago, and got him back settled, and they're headed this way. Verse 18, Seeing that Abram shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. Now, how will all the nations be blessed by Abraham? Because through his lineage comes Christ. And everybody, just as Eve is Mother Eve, because through her lineage would come Christ. And she's the mother of or Christ is or she's the mother of all living because Christ gives life. Well, Abraham is a blessing to all nations because through his lineage would come this Christ child. Verse 19, For I know that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So you see, God makes a covenant. But most of the time, anytime there's a covenant made or a promise made, there's also a if. For such a little word, it carries a lot of wor- uh, a lot of weight. If you do this, then I'll do this. If you believe upon Jesus Christ, you will receive everlasting life. Verse twenty. And the Lord said, "Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because the sin is very grievous, I will go down now." and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So now the, the two angels are going down there to handle business. Abraham's going to try to do a little convincing here. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And now you know he's thinking of his nephew here, Lot. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place with the fifty righteous that are therein? Are you going to allow those fifty to go down and, and, and die because of the wickedness around them? Verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So what he's saying here, he's saying, you're righteous, and that just don't seem, basically, it just don't seem fair, is what he's saying. They've lived righteously their whole life, and 
you're just going to go down there and just put them all in one big pot with, with everybody. Now, naturally, we know God's not going to do that. Verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then will I spare all the places for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? So maybe there's not fifty, but what if, what if there's forty-five? And he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will do it for I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. So he already said, You know, I, I know I'm talking to the creator of heaven and earth, and I'm nothing but just dust that was formed. And dust I'll return to, basically is what he said back in chapter twenty seven. I mean verse twenty seven. And now, you know, he, he's kind of He's taken a little far, but he don't want God to be angry with him. Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure thou shalt be thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once meaning just, just one more. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went on his way as soon as he left, as soon as he had left communion with Abram. And Abram, Abraham returned to his place. So Abraham is just steadily, you know, he's got to be thinking of Lot and his family. Maybe if, if his family is righteous, if if he has enough people, if maybe he convinced some folks around there and there's just 10, maybe that'll save him. Continuing on, verse chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at, the, at even. Now that lets you know right there, these two men that were with God, these are the angels. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now this is a judgment seat, like basically like a, a, a city judge or so. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn I, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Verse 3, And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto, uh, unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now this is kind of a, I guess you could say this is a type for the Passover. This, you have your unleavened bread, it turned into the house for the night, and there's going to be divine protection put upon Lot during this time. Now these angels, they can hold their own. They didn't need Lot's protection. It's going to turn out that Lot needs their protection. Verse 4, But before they lay down, the men of the city... Even the men of Sodom compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, both old and young. A every one of these people in this town were, were perverted. They, they were wicked, okay? And they, didn't even, they just got to eat their dinner and didn't even get to lay down yet, and they were already there. Verse five, and they called on the lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in at, at uh, which came in to thee this night? Bring them unto us that we may know them. Now that's pretty, you know that that's where Sodom gets his name from. And Lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him. Now he's he's protecting the angels and he's stepping out front because they all know him. Naturally, he was sitting in the in the judgment seat. Okay, so he's. Kind of a basically a public figure, I guess you could say. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known a man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, 
For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. I, I just cannot see how somebody could do that. Give up your own daughters uh, to a gang like this. Maybe he knew that they weren't in the daughters or something. Uh, it would, as, as far as that goes, they'd have to go through me. And that just, that would probably be a really, really tough thing for them to do. It better. It, it, they, they better be tough if they're going to come after, you know, that just, that just don't cut it right there. I don't understand this. But at the same time, there was a tradition or a code that if somebody was staying as a guest in your house, then you had to protect them with everything you had. They became kind of, I guess, more important to protect or whatever. But I, I still just don't understand the, the, that's just not something I could do right there. Anyway, uh, verse 9, and they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon Lot, uh, the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Now they were fixing to go in. They, they were doing their best to get in after these men. It, this shows you the wickedness that was in this town. But the men put forth their hand, the angels, and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they, were, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any besides? Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. That means get your stuff together, let's go. We're fixing, to, we're fixing to get out of here because these folks don't deserve to be able to do anything anymore. Verse 13. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that that mocked unto his son-in-laws. You know, they, they were pretty comfortable there. They thought he'd just run away. Like they, they thought he'd lost his mind a little bit. And when the morning rose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the, and the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So he was kind of dragging his feet. He was kind of thinking, you know, I just, he liked it there. You know, he was a city dweller. He had it nice, and now they're fixing to put him out in the wilderness, and he's going to have to kind of tough it out for a little bit. And, you know, the ways of the city were just pretty nice. It just had a few, uh, whatever you want to call them, a few, a few Wicked folks, I just I guess that would be best you could say. Verse 17, And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Now, the mercy of God allowed him to get out of here. They grabbed him and they jerked him out. Now they're telling him, run away. Run and don't look back. Now, that same mercy was applied at the cross. That love was given out through all the blood that Christ shed, through the torture and the crucifixion. That mercy from God is given to us through grace. And we're not to look back. Whenever we're saved, we're not to look back. We are to continue to look forward, to look into Christ as our example, and to walk that path. Now, every one of us is flesh. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But that's where repentance comes in. Every once in a while, you, you, you know, you're going to stumble. That's okay, repent. But mean it. Now they're telling Lot, don't look back to this place. This place is horrible. You just run on into the mountains. You'll be taken care of. But this place is gone. It's, it's fixing to turn into a fiery furnace, all right? Verse 18, Lot said in them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, 
Now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and now has magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Now he's just had two angels here, drug him out by the hand, and said, God's had mercy on you. Go to the mountain. These angels are protecting. He's got divine protection, and now he's saying, well, something evil might catch me in the mountain. Hmm. Verse 20, Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So he's wanting to go right back into the city. He's coming out of this evil city. He's being saved out of this evil city. He's wanting to go right back into another city. And he said unto them, See, I have, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. What they're saying is you, gotta, you just got to get away. We can't call in the, the destruction until you're clear, because God made a promise to Abraham. Verse 23, The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and they which grew upon the, gr uh, which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this. So, you know, there's all kind of speculation, and some say, oh, that's just a fairy tale or whatever. But in this region, Sodom is known for being in the north part of the Dead Sea, right? You know, pretty close to the, the Salt Sea, okay? And in that region, if something is still for very long, if it, say, a, a shrub, It'll get covered in salt from the, basically, the sea spray. And it'll cover it and mineralize it, and it will become a little bush of salt. So basically, Lot's wife turned and looked back and died. And with her body laying there, it turned to salt, a pillar of salt, okay, because of the, the sea spray, basically, you could say. 27, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Now, he kind of argued about this a little bit. He, he didn't want to go to the cave. He wanted to go to this other city. But then he saw the power of God rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah and decided, you know, I'll probably go do what the angels said. The angels wanted me to go there. It's probably best I ease on out. I probably don't need to be in a city right now. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. So they're thinking the earth is destroyed. The whole world is gone. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. So that, you know, that sounds a bit strange these days. There is, at this point, there's no law against incest. It's just, it's, um, you know, what it is, I guess, in this deal. 33. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. He, he, pulled, a, he pulled a good drunk there. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight, or last night, with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed for our father. And they made their, water, their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. So he pulled another good drunk. Thus were both daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. Now you might, that might sound familiar because of the Moabites. 
during the Exodus. There they become a tribe, and they are a, a Adamic tribe. They're from the line of Adam, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare and called his name Ben Ami. The same is the children of the father of the children of Ammon unto this day, the Ammonites. Okay. So, you know, one thing also that we need to look at on this, or that, you know, take notice of. Abraham looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, said it looked like a fiery, the smoke of a furnace. And if you remember in Daniel, there were the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were placed in a fiery furnace, heated seven times hotter than necessary, seven times hotter than normal operation. And they came out and didn't even smell like smoke. But you remember Nebuchadnezzar looked in and he said, how many men did we throw in this furnace? And when they opened the doors to put them in there, it killed the guards next to them, the guards, because it was so hot, it basically had a, a, I can't remember what it's called, a backdraft. And it blew the fire out and, and killed the guards and they threw these Hebrew children in there. And Nebuchadnezzar looked and he said, how many did we put in there? And they said, well, we put three in. And they said, well, I see four. And the fourth even looks like the Son of God. And it was God himself as Christ or Melchizedek or, or whatever name you want to call him was in the furnace just as these angels came to Sodom and had him there by the hand. They were rejoicing and praising it was that mercy that was dealt out. And that even Nebuchadnezzar became a believer and wrote one of the, a beautiful chapter in the book of Daniel. If I remember right, it's chapter 4. I might be off on that, but I believe it's chapter 4. It was written by Nebuchadnezzar and during this time of, I guess, uh, salvation and, and kind of uh, he was reflecting, I guess you could say. So we'll pick it up in chapter 20 in the next study. We're going to get into kind of Abraham moving around again. And just remember, no matter where you're at, no matter what's going on, if you rely on God, put your trust and your faith in God. Put on that full armor of God and read His Word. This Word is the sword that we're to carry through this world. And it don't matter if the world's erupting. God will protect you. You know, everybody gets worried about the, the end times and this great fire that's going to come down and, and the, the fire of God that's going to rain and just, just tear everything up. Well, you got to remember, God is a consuming fire. And for us, that fire is the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is sent to comfort and to teach and to direct now, for others who are wicked, just as these Sodomites were, these, these folks from Sodom, it's not there to comfort. It's there to weed out and to destroy. But just as in the furnace, that furnace was there to destroy. But that Holy Spirit surrounded those children. They came out, didn't even smell like smoke. And that's the way we can make it through this world, is having that Spirit around us, keeping God in us, so that we can make it through this world. God bless you, and y'all have a great day. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of the Humans Under Grace Bible Study Podcast. If you have any questions, you can go to our website at www.humansundergrace.com and under the Contact Us page, submit your question. Also, you can write to us at Humans Under Grace, P.O. Box 1467, Tatum, Texas, 75691. Thank you and God bless you.